Welcome to the newsroom. I'm Owen Poindexter, senior writer with Front Office Sports. Bit of news before we jump into things. Uh, we are rejiggering our podcast situation here at FOS. Uh, this podcast and my other passion are saying goodbye for now. We're going to focus our efforts on the lead off and we've got some really exciting stuff planned for the new year. So if you've not already, please do subscribe to the lead off our, our flagship podcast here at front office sports. One is a great product already. You get the biggest stories in the sports business world in five minutes or less every single weekday. Uh, and we've got some, like I said, exciting stuff planned uh, for the new year. I'm not going to spoil it. Um, but, but yeah, so keep an eye out for that. But we do have this episode coming at you right now. I'm super excited for you to listen to it. Uh, I just had a great conversation with Mark Patrikoff. He is the founder and CEO of Patrikoff & Co., who helps athletes invest in, um, in just a, a variety of companies. And really interesting how he got there. He has a really interesting background. And he works with a bunch of names that you've definitely heard of and has some good stories and just a lot of interesting insights in the athletes and investments, what they can bring to the table, how people like him can help them sort of see their, their vision through. So we'll have that right after this. 2000, 2008, 2022. When it comes to the economy, those are some scary years. Dot com crash, housing crash, and the roller coaster we're going through right now. One thing is certain, it's a dangerous time to not know your numbers, but over 31,000 businesses have the confidence and clarity they need because they rely on NetSuite by Oracle, the number one cloud financial system. NetSuite gives you visibility and control of your financials, inventory, HR, planning, and budgeting, so you can manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need, all in one place. So how do you prepare for uncertain times? The answer, NetSuite. NetSuite helps you identify rising costs, automate your business processes, and easily see where to save money. That's why 93% of customers say they improve their visibility and control when they upgraded to NetSuite. What are you waiting for? Right now, NetSuite is offering a one-of-a-kind flexible financing program. Head to netsuite.com slash the newsroom right now. netsuite.com slash the newsroom. netsuite.com slash the newsroom. All right, today I am joined by Mark Patrikoff, founder and CEO of Patrikoff Co. Welcome, Mark. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So, yeah, a ton of stuff I want to ask you about because you are really at the nexus of sports and business and investments. Uh, but first, I just want to get to know you a little bit. Um, where'd you grow up? Grew up in the city, New York City, mm -hmm. uh, Upper East Side. I'm from New York, and the city is New York City to me as well. Where'd you go to high school? Uh, Dalton. Oh, my daughter did too. I went to Fieldston, oh, wow. so. Oh, nice, yeah. Yeah, yeah very cool. City kid, spent the first six years of my career, though, in Los Angeles. I went to, um, out to L.A. to be in the film business. I ended up spending a good chunk of time. I worked at um, a talent agency, creative artist mm -hmm. agency, CA. Oh, and nice. Heard of them too? <laughs> yeah. Sowed my oats in, uh, in my career there, and learned a lot kind of under the radar and, and figured out how the media industry and the entertainment business worked. And that was sort of the launching pad for me. Uh -huh. and, and were you an agent or uh, what were you doing at CIA? Yeah, so I actually started in the mailroom as a trainee and I mm -hmm. didn't have the patience to go through the normal process, especially then in the nineties when it was really regimented how you went from mailroom to agent. I was just in a rush always in life and ended up working in the story department, kind of reading scripts and giving story notes to different directing and acting clients. And then I worked on some special projects, which is how I sort of learned a little bit about finance. Um, CA did a ton of stuff, Coca-Cola, Nike, um, film studios, looking at financing strategies and other kind of corporate development activities. And I got to work a little bit in that area and then uh, figured out that it was time for me to go start my own thing and left, which I think, I think shocked a lot of people because at that time no one really was leaving CA. And I started an internet incubator in the, the late 90s, back in New York. I wanted to come home too. And I built a internet kind of company from my living room. The, the original kind of stories around those type of businesses were pretty accurate. And built it into a fairly substantial 350 person um, internet kind of incubator in the early sense of the word, which was for us um, about partnering with the film studios, the television production companies on creating digital content. And then instead of getting paid to do that, we did it on a rev share basis and took ownership in those projects. And we did really cool things. I mean, we did a, a, a movie streaming site called uh, The Screening Room with Sony, and we had the, um, exclusive rights to their movies to stream them online. Obviously, it was too early uh, for it to really work all that well, but it was a cool idea. We did a website called All True Videos with user-generated videos being uploaded. So early, too early. 
Uh, yeah, yeah. Have, what what era are we talking about when when you talk uh, about the ninety seven to two thousand two? Wow. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When like streaming, was, I mean, part. like Netflix. Netflix with like the DVD version. I don't think was a thing. Maybe it was I just wasn't there yet. Thing no, then. it was yeah, really wow. early. It was really early. I mean, we had very smart people. The internet was great then, especially in the first version of it, because we were hiring finance people from Goldman Sachs, Hollywood people from the agencies and studios. We had everybody who was looking at what they should be doing on the internet, building a dot com business, looking to companies like ours to help them do that. And because we had this focus on entertainment and content. Um, it attracted people in that industry. So we had the heads of every major company in and around that space coming to us for advice and guidance. And really, who were we to actually answer those questions? But in the absence of someone better, we did and, and sort of built a pretty cool business for a while around that. But then when the crash came and um, people got rational about the fact that they could build Sorry, these things. the dot-com crash or the uh, housing yeah. crash? Yeah. Oh, wait. One of the many, many crashes. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the dot-com crash. Uh -huh. uh, my company crashed along with it. I was able to yeah. sell it. Um, to Omnicom, uh, so it was, a, it was a good save, if you will, but, but it yeah. was painful. But I learned a lot more taking my business apart than I did putting it together. So deconstructing a $350, $50 million business was a lot more interesting in some ways, a lot more depressing, a lot less fun, but I learned a lot and I've been able to apply that ever since. But I did learn um, a lot about how content deals were made and had great relationships. I mean, the people with whom I matriculated in Hollywood we're starting to take meaningful jobs at higher levels across the industry. And I was able to then parlay that into a fairly successful investment banking career. I, I, my second business was a boutique investment bank called Mesa. I had two great partners and we sort of at the time really only had Allen and company to, to deal with in terms of boutiques doing media deals. And we had this deep set of contacts and relationships and knowledge around how do you monetize IP? And that was really the core of the business. And we ended up Having a fairly substantial practice, we advised you know the buyers of Miramax Studios at the same time. We were helping Airbnb raise capital, raising capital for FanDuel, doing film slates for IMAX and Fox and Disney and all kinds of stuff like that. So uh, really interesting, kind of fairly you know substantial business that I was able to sell in 2015. Uh, at the time, I went to work for the buyer. I had a three-year earnout, so I had no choice. But I also felt obligated, of course. And while I was doing my earnout, I was asked by Verizon, who were at the time trying to compete with Netflix and Hulu to build their own OTT platform, um, if I would co-host a television show with Rob Gronkowski. It was sort of a shark tank for pro athletes. And we did over two years, 36 episodes. It was Gronk and myself and um, four other athletes uh, as a panel meeting a company and deciding whether or not to invest uh, or cut a marketing deal. And I was sort of the one who helped negotiate those deals on air. And um, it gave me this great access. I was a lifelong sports fan, but had never done deals in the sports space. So it gave me this great access to everyone from Kevin Durant to Todd Gurley to Antonio Brown, et cetera. And I figured out over the course of those two years, hanging out in the monster, sponsor, monster beverage sponsored green room, which made mm -hmm. Gronk very happy. Mm -hmm. um, that these athletes were not getting a lot of advice on the direct investments they were doing. Their wealth managers, uh, full range of you know poor quality to high quality, but they didn't really want to touch the alts or the private deals, and the agents certainly didn't either. The agents wanted them on the field or ice or court making money. So they were going in blind, and therefore they were making poor decisions. It wasn't because they weren't necessarily smart or thoughtful investors, they just didn't have access to the right type of deals and no, and no guidance or strategy around that. So that's where the idea for this business came from. And then I spent a little bit of time um, kind of drafting a short deck kind of for a merchant bank for pro athletes. And that was sort of the, the, the beginnings of what we have now four years later built. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, yeah, that and that leads right into the next thing yeah. I want to talk about, which is what you got you. going on now. Um, and um, so. So, yeah, so athletes have had wealth managers for a long time, but it sounds like, you know, maybe they, I don't know, put money in index funds or just like manage a stock portfolio and the athlete just says I mean, that's sort of doing them a little bit of a disservice i mean there's a there's a like anything else in life there are full service incredibly smart and thoughtful and well-connected wealth managers and then there's the opposite there you know the, the larger wealth manager, management platforms usually have some kind of proprietary alts product to offer their clients so whether it's a private equity play or it's a venture play or it's you know hedge funds that they that they like to invest in um, but the kind of average athlete has more of a mid-sized wealth management firm or a smaller wealth management firm who don't have anything to offer in the direct space, nor do they necessarily have the experience on how to evaluate direct investments. 
So that was where I saw the kind of play. Also, athletes have been way overexposed to venture um, for a lot of obvious reasons, which I'm happy to share if it, it, it would be helpful. But, but the, the typical athlete investor was kind of cutting a fifty to a $250,000 check in either a real estate deal that came to them through a local connection from where they grew up or where they went to college or where they play or a, a venture deal that could have found them in the locker room with no context for why that may or may not make sense. And also without the the kind of broader context of you really can't do venture investing in a one-off basis. You need to have a portfolio and there's got to be a thesis behind that portfolio and you have to be out in the market and know who to co-invest with, et cetera. So they were getting burned. And then surprise, surprise, you know, they were blaming whoever it was, you know, in their immediate circle um, for not stopping them from doing it. So part of the business when I started was to help them say no to things, not just say yes to things. Right. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Cause I'm sure they've got people coming to them from all sides. Like, if they're the you know the kid who grew up to be a multimillionaire in their town, and their buddy growing up or whoever it is has a business idea or a thing, some project yeah. where they say, yeah, I could really use hundred thousand dollars, million dollars to make this thing. Who do I know? Well, I know this guy. Um, and not necessarily poor, with, poor, with with poor intentions in every case. Sure. Some some sadly some. But you know, it's not just um, venture investing. I have a MBA player whose name everybody would know um, who invested in a children's fishing rod company. It was actually a pretty cool idea. Target sells it now. Um, but he didn't even know what he had. So it, it wasn't just bad investments. It was a good investment that, frankly, instead of trying to exit when they were raising some money, we helped them figure out he's better off staying in it because it's actually a good investment. So it, it, it's as much about that as it is um, stopping them from doing something or trying to grab their money. It was really more how do you stabilize and, and kind of professionalize the way these athletes take advantage of what is an extremely unique opportunity while they're playing, which is the fact that they are, they're relevant to people who have deal flow that is interesting for the average investor, but otherwise unavailable. But as an athlete, you might be able to get into something that you and I potentially could not. And how to select which ones of those to do. And also, how do you maintain kind of check size so you don't overexpose yourself to any one investment. But, but if it's a $15 million investment has to be made, you know, if you, if you pull capital with a bunch of other friends, like-minded people, you might be able to get in, whereas if you were just writing a $100,000 check, you, you couldn't. So there were a lot of moving pieces around why this made sense. But the first piece of it had to be build this advisory practice that helped, again, make these athletes better, smarter, faster thinking business people, knowing they had incredible success in one field. Doesn't guarantee success in another, but it did, in this case, guarantee the opportunity to be successful. Right. And yeah, and actually, I wanted to see in out between. on Sorry, yeah. Um, I wanted to zoom out on that. Like, uh, from your end, why why focus on athletes to begin with? So I would say uh, three reasons. Number one, I love sports, and I've, I've had many of our clients ask me that. We have two hundred athlete clients here now. I've had I don't know twenty percent of them have asked me why why sports, not entertainment. Because for me, I had much better access to Hollywood people than I and music people than I did uh, in sports. I mean, I love sports, so that's a, that's an easy example of what what you do and kind of. You know, the next phase of your career, I had the luxury of, of having you know, done pretty well early in my life financially, so I, I could pick and choose. So sports, I've always kind of thought about what I could do in sports. Number two, um, and I'll get to the most important at the end. Number two, I thought they actually needed this um, in, a, in a different way than entertainment people need it. Um, they needed this set of services and advice and access to the right deals in a way that no other constituency of people who have Kind of consumer value uh, would need it. And the last thing is, um, if you think about it this way, our current client base, 196 clients, um, ha will make $1.9 billion in their current seasons. So it can't say calendar year, because right. So in the current season, if you ask any wealth manager, any wealth manager, small to large, Goldman Sachs to the sole proprietor down the street, what percentage of a high net worth individuals um, net worth should go into alternatives. That would include real estate, private investments, et cetera. An honest person is going to say 10 to 30%, maybe 10 to 25%. And the ones who are more educated and more interested in that stuff would, would, would skew on the higher end of that. And the ones who really don't know much about it would, would go to the lower end. So if you take a billion nine, figure you lose half of that to taxes, right? And say instead of, you know, you got 10, say you put 10% of that into alts. So you can do the math. Mm -hmm. you start, you're, you're, you're talking about eight hundred million dollars. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean you're talking about a lot, a lot of money. Uh, well, uh, pre-tax. So you know, but but it, it's it's right, a right. significant, a significant amount of money. So um, 
that's too much money to be out in the world. You know, hundreds of millions of dollars of investable capital that doesn't have um, a direction. So that was really the thinking here. Um, you know, you, you, uh, you're, you're talking about a meaningful amount of money on an annual basis. So if it's, you know, right. 150, 200 million dollars per year over, we look at things in a three or four year cycle, that's how you get to 800. Um, so you figure 200 million a year for four years, that's about, you know, what the contract length is. You're talking about 800 million dollars of investable capital with no firm out in the market providing guidance on how to do that, number one. Number two, we always believed, and now it's been proven out, that for every one athlete dollar you put into a deal, you probably could piggyback some other money behind it because um, people like to be in business with athletes. So we've come now over four years figured out that it's about three to one. So that means you can put, you've got about two and a half billion dollars now of investable capital that actually has differentiation from arguably any other capital pool out in the marketplace. Yeah. That's, that's, a, that's a big business opportunity. That's kind of how I looked at it in terms of the TAM. Yeah, so, and so that that kind of starts to answer the question of how this is different from um, you're different from wealth managing. So then I'm imagine some amount of your clients just say like I'm making all this money, I don't I want it to grow steadily and to not just fritter away. Help me out with that. And some are probably coming to you saying you know like here's this investment opportunity or I've always wanted to do this or here's my passion. Um, so yeah, talk to me a little bit about that balance and just like the sort of different types of clients that you see. Well, so. I'll answer the question, but I might answer it in, a, in an indirect way. So we we have a model that works like this. So we get an allocation. So we only do investments. We've made 20 investments, uh, two real estate investments and 18 late stage growth or buyouts, all consumer, all led by one of about 15 of the what we would consider the top you know, performing private equity funds. So if there isn't a branded top tier fund leading the deal, a Bain, a, a, you know, a, a Providence, uh, KKR, uh, you know, L. Catterton, we don't do it. So we're getting their diligence on our own. But, but if you think about it this way, um, we get an allocation in the deal. Let's say we get a $20 million allocation in Cholula hot sauce from L. Catterton. We want about a third of the capital, as I said before, to come from the athletes, and about two thirds comes from my capital, and then, and then we've, um, we've got a really good strategic partner, uh, J.P. Morgan, as, as our other partner. Heard of them? We, we do not take athlete capital. So the athletes in our model opt in on a deal by deal basis. We will not take an athlete's capital unless they've done a Zoom or phone call or meeting with us about that deal. So we are insistent upon each of the athletes, and, and the yield on our deals are about uh, pretty consistent. It's about a third of our athletes go in every deal, but a different third. So it's, it's really very effective. So the goal for the business was that every one of our athlete clients, because of the service offerings, because of our advisory practice, will end up having an opinion on every investment we do, not that they'll invest in every company we invest in. That was core to our vision, and I'm certain now that that was correct. So we have about, um, I said about 100, you know, I think it's 196 athletes. Uh, 95% of them have invested in more than one deal, or 90, 90, 90 plus percent have invested in more than one deal. Um, I, my goal is not to have Aaron Rodgers invest in everything we do and not, and, and not build a relationship with us. We want Aaron Rodgers to be incredibly sophisticated and thoughtful about the businesses he chooses, and then also incredibly thoughtful about ones he doesn't want to invest in and to have an answer to us and to his other colleagues why he's not investing. A, because we think it makes them um, better business people long term, and B, the hope and the belief here is that if you are leaning, in, that, that if you are you are focused on what you're doing and you're you're part, you're a participant in the process post the actual closing of the investment, you are far more likely to lean in and be helpful to that company. So our our, our model requires this very. Um, I think, um, thoughtful activation process. So we close an investment in a Cholula or, or a Kodiak or a Virgin Voyages. We are at work day one on activating uh, our athlete shareholders, not in the way a celebrity endorser might be involved, but in a way I might be involved if someone had me put a half million dollars into their company, opening doors, coming to meetings, sharing ideas. So for example, we invested in a company called Old Smokey, which is a very large uh, whiskey company in Tennessee. They want our athletes to have no involvement on the consumer side of what they're doing, but they do want our athletes involved in, in opening doors with distributors in different markets. So for example, if they're trying to crack the Kansas City market, 
they're much more effective going into that meeting or jumping on a Zoom with Travis Kelsey to, uh, saying, I'm an investor in the business. That was core to the whole idea here. And, and Travis wouldn't do that if he hadn't been thoughtful and asked all the questions and been taken through the entire presentation and made an educated decision. So we've been very careful about selecting athletes who are interested in doing that. So we could have 500 athletes here if we had just opened the doors to anybody who just wants to blindly write checks. Um, we've turned athletes down and still do on a very regular basis. And we've made some mistakes too, of course, as you would imagine, but, but not many. Yeah. Yeah. And imagine, you know, if you're a you know, Missouri distributor getting a call from Travis Kelsey and he can actually talk the talk and say, you know, I, I looked into this business. Here's, you know, exactly. here's all the reasons I invested. And it's not just like, exactly. you know, why are you throwing this random celebrity at me? Exactly. Um, and yeah, I'm wondering, um, which, which kind of makes me think of another thing I was just curious about. Oh, uh, you know, when you're talking about what you do or just you, whatever is talking to athletes, what are the misconceptions that you get um, from the general public and also maybe people who could be investors or could be yeah, clients? It's like the uh, it's like the second wife syndrome. You're blamed for everything the first wife did. I mean, you know, <laughs> everything you could imagine. Ballers to um, it's, a, it's an athlete fund, which it absolutely is not to the athletes have no brain power. Well, I say to people when they say that every single time. Just like there are smart bankers and dumb bankers and smart doctors and less smart doctors, there are smart athletes and they just need to exercise the right muscles. So the misconception is first and foremost really treating them unfairly. And, and, and yeah. you know we have a whole education process here. Um, for instance, um, last night we hosted an event in, uh, at Bain Capital in Boston and we had three Patriots, three Celtics and four Miami Heat. and. Um, the CEO of Bain, and they did a two-hour um, walkthrough of Bain's entire business. We educate and, and, and we explain, you know, the pros and cons of, of, of a consumer versus other verticals. They broke down um, an investment that they made in, uh, in um, Canada Goose. Uh, the, 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 the work we put these guys through before we'll take their money is pretty significant. We do lectures, we do speaker series. Um, uh, we do networking events for them with private equity partners. It's all about, um, for us, getting them to think and row kind of at the same speed and same direction so that when they make a decision about an investment, whether it's one we source for them or one someone else source for them, they make it wisely. And we get the PE funds um, to participate in all kinds of ways. Um, and it also is great marketing for us. So it's fun for Bain to have those 10 players in their offices. And we've done a deal with Bain. I'm sure we'll do another one. And, 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 and they've seen the benefit of the players' involvement. Not yesterday, but I mean, in the deal we've done together, which is Virgin, uh, the players have been extremely involved in all kinds of ways. And, and, you know, it's not every player in every deal. So you may have 60 athletes invest in a company. You only need the five or six who actually default to kind of being deeply interested. But we still need the other, you know, group who went in to be educated about the business. And to the degree you can talk about this, I'm curious if you've got uh, anecdotes or just anything else from, you know, specific athletes that we might have heard of in terms of just, you know, maybe being not the kind of investor that you might think or, um, yeah, just just who, who kind of pops out in your head of like, you know, maybe a didn't see that coming kind of kind of client. Well, I'll tell you that Dwayne Wade did a Instagram live cooking class with his mom for Cholula without being paid because he was an investor. <laughs> and that was a pretty good one. No, I mean, I, I, I actually it's a good question. I have to think about it. Uh, first of all, our business is structured and, and not to kind of make this too dry, but we have, you know, a dozen people, you know, four who are full-time working with the athletes and the other eight are in finance. Um, and they're, of course, they're integrated as best we can. But, um, you know, the athletes are, are I think, um, would surprise you uh, in terms of the questions they ask and, and the way they approach things. But, I, you know, I, I, if I think of a good funny story before we're off, I'll, t I'll come up oh, with yeah. it. But the, with Dwayne Wade doing the cooking class with his mom was pretty fun. I would tell you, though, that um, we do... It's interesting. When we started the business, we, when we started with no clients, and now we have 195, but, but, or 96, but um, the deal flow, we see a lot of deals from these guys. They, they get a lot of stuff handed to them. A lot of real estate, but a lot of other stuff. The quality of deals between day one and today has changed materially. I mean, the, the, we, we are now looking at two investment opportunities that were sourced by our clients. That day will come. So uh, as much as I wish I could give you five more funny anecdotes, I, it's really more on the serious side. I mean, this idea of a merchant bank for these athletes, it was sort of a missing piece, I think, for them um, that can really accelerate what they do. And remember, we're not their wealth managers. We are 
in complete collaboration with all of their wealth managers. We're transparent. Same with their agents. So we're sort of Switzerland in the sports space. We have um, coaching clients. We've got the San Francisco 49ers and LA Rams head coaches as clients. We've got Adam Schefter and Adrian Wojnarowski as clients. We have Matt Barry, who's the number one fantasy guy. Um, we have GMs as clients, the Raven GM, uh, the Niners GM. So, you know, we're sort of a, a sports ecosystem that operates in a world where everyone's competitive, literally on the field and figuratively in every other way, um, where we are kind of everyone's friend, at least for now, which is a, which has proved to be really, proven to be really, you know, helpful both from a recruiting standpoint, but also just a collaboration standpoint. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so I'll I've tell been... you a funny story. I'm sorry, I got one. So yeah, go for it. the launch party, the launch party for Virgin uh, was, I think, it was on on the Virgin ship, you know, one of the two ships, ships in Miami. And Richard Branson came, and Venus Williams. We had like 15 players who were there uh, for the party, but there was a karaoke room, and Venus loves karaoke. And at four in the morning, Venus and Richard Williams, was, uh, Richard uh, Branson, were still doing karaoke together. Nice. Yeah, awesome. Uh, but well, Xavier that... Howard just wanted to have ice cream, so there you yeah. go. <laughs> yeah. Oh, actually, I lived in Japan for a year, and um, the train stop from uh, you know it's like midnight to 5 a.m. something like that, and on a weekend night, this was you know. When I was younger and could do this kind of thing, you'd reach that point in the night. And it's like, okay, we're going home right now, or we're singing all night. And usually, the answer yeah, is we're go. singing all night. Yeah, of um, course. So you know, Venus and, and, and Bramson did that together. All right. Well, I was already a Venus Williams fan, but that that takes her up a notch. She's great. Um, yeah. um, so I, I've been uh, with Front Office Sports almost two years now, and so I may have a, um, a skewed perspective on this, but it feels like. Athlete investments is another trend that that you are early on. That's kind of taken on a, a whole life of its own. Is that what you've seen too, or has this been a sort of a steadier journey um, from you know just athletes interested in being entrepreneurs and and just you know making their money work for I, them? Problem is, you rarely get rewarded for being first in something. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, I think as yes someone who started a streaming I, company in you know nineteen ninety eight yeah, or something, I, mean, I guess. Yeah, I, I mean, yes and no. I would say that if you look at uh, in my original deck for J.P. Morgan, because they were older than I am, so they were able to identify with this player. But there was a guy named Junior Bridgman, who was a sixth man in the NBA, never made more than three hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, never played an All Star game. Um, good player, but 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 not not a star. Uh, he took his knowledge and, and and smarts and access in the Milwaukee kind of market. And started investing in Wendy's franchises, and he invested in a chocolate company. Now he's worth six hundred million dollars. You know, Magic Johnson, Roger Staubach has done incredibly well in real estate. We, I saw examples of this in the past, uh, but they were so few and far between. But of course, thirty for thirty broke, and fifty other nasty articles about players. So you know, I, I think that, I think it's always there's always been some who understood that. You know, Dwayne Wade said to me every time he went to a road, uh, on a road on a road trip. He would make sure to meet the opposing team's owner. Hmm. So there are guys who just got it, and then they were able to parlay that to something much more meaningful. But as a group, they didn't. The, this idea of these athlete funds, and there are obviously a bunch of them. Um, I have a strong point of view on them. It's not just. It's not really negative as much as it is. Um, I question whether the value that gets created is really um, what's what's promised, and that and that. Um, the model itself, like the idea of fund investing is really not necessarily for the person who wants to do a few things and have an impact. I mean, our guys believe it. Dwayne did that cooking class with his mom, not just because it was fun to his mother, but because he believed, based on, I think, some education we gave him, that by doing that, you've increased the value of your X dollar investment. And that the outcome of these businesses in which we are investing, because of these athletes' involvement, will look different. I think the, the, the historically, certainly in the last phase, it's been a lot of barring for equity and, and losing your name and getting some shares. And the truth is, you really have to invest to make money. And, and the theory of um, kind of compounding is kind of what I base the business on. This is Warren Buffett, you know, you double your money every few years, you're going to do really well. You don't have to swing for the fences. So I think a lot of these funds and other things are all oriented around we're going to be the next big venture investors, the big tech investors. The truth is that you can make as much money or more, you know, with a strategy that just hits doubles. And we did a presentation for our players recently that showed all the people who, who had made their money after 30, for example. Like Warren Buffett had a million dollars in the bank at 30. Um, and try to make sure they understand that if you are 30 years old and you've got, you know, a million to $20 million in the bank, forget the big, big money, um, 
and, and, and you want to not just invest, by the way. I think they should work. We do a lot of um, – we're doing an internship program now with nine portfolio companies and two financial sponsors for our players. I mean, all kinds of things to get them thinking about taking advantage of the fact that they are relevant people and they can build a platform for themselves that can create second and third careers and, uh, and invest as well. And um, I think these funds are not – they're approaching it differently. So I'm not saying they're exploiting the athletes, but – they lean more in that direction, I would say. Yeah, and you know, and there, there's an obvious celebrity. This is like you know clearly part of it to having an athlete investor. We saw this during the SPAC craze. Of, you know, we did a bunch of stories here of you know here's a new SPAC and uh, you know Shaq's investing, Durant's investing, and actually those they both have reputations as very thoughtful investors. But some people are clearly just lending their name. Often they kind of cash out before anything really happens with the company anyway. Um, and you know, it's a way to get publicity or not, but I mean, right, yeah, yeah. And you know, sometimes that publicity is, is not the kind you want as we're seeing with say FTX, um, where, you know, when right. you just jump on a craze, sometimes the, the, craze I spoke the... to the whole, I spoke to the entire Miami Dolphins team in, uh, March and the guy who went before me, it was like a one day business combine they did for the players. The guy before me was a, a crypto guy. He was like he was in black shorts and army boots and a black T-shirt and he had a headset and a black baseball cap and he was selling them on. They should take all their salary in crypto and FTX was this and that. Mm-hmm. And I had to go after him and he was a very good speaker. He was a lot of fun. I'm definitely not those things, at least not on a stage. And uh, <laughs> I said I just you know I did my speech about second careers and they should get jobs after they play and you know they're like they're like this until and the first question I said any questions the first person asked me what did you think of the guy before you and <laughs> uh-huh. I I politely said I don't believe it I don't buy any of it I think you should take your salary and cash I think you know it's not the time for you people if you want to be a, if you want to educate yourself and be an expert in crypto someone's going to do really well crypto's not going to go away but this this kind of this kind of defaulting to what's hot and and, and sounds good is very dangerous and um you know, the guys who get it should be clients here. The guys who don't get that shouldn't be. It's in a way, it's a good indicator yeah. for them. I mean, yeah, what, what I feel like especially, yeah, especially these days, you just you don't have to mark watch the markets that long. You know, maybe like two, three, four years before you just see one of those cycles of you know like NFTs, crypto. You know, and like the housing crash was like took s- several decades to happen, but like, um, but yeah, now the, these cycles are it's so it's all pretty so predictable, fast. exactly. And I, and I was young once, you know, I was in my 20s and I got burned by believing the internet. I mean, I had a chance to sell my internet company for just under 100 million bucks when I owned the whole thing. And instead, I raised $25 million and I sold it for a lot less than 100 million bucks two years later. But I was, you know, and I'm not saying to the wrong thing, but, uh, but you know, you got you, you to gotta learn from your trial and error in the right way. You just try not to get burned too badly while you're learning. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, I, I should let you go. But uh, before we do, uh, I'm just curious if there's. Um, one trend you want to point out, whether that's in like the investment world or like the sort of athletes getting involved in investments, uh, just something you're seeing that's kind of emerging right now as someone who's, uh, you know, been on the forefront of a few of these. I think to stick to the theme of what you do for a living, I would say you're going to see more and more athletes um, participating in team ownership over the next cycle. I mean, we saw the NBA, well, Dwayne, we actually helped Dwayne with um his jazz deal. We had, we were looking at a different NBA team with him first, but but put Dwayne aside. I think you're going to see it uh, across sports management, ownership, etc. And what's going to happen is um, you saw the NBA kind of swap the family generation of owners for these new generation of primarily you know recent billionaires. It hasn't happened yet in the NFL, but it's going to. Um, the families that own you know the Rooney's and the Maras, all the old families that own, have owned these teams for many generations, the Hunts. Um, are going to ultimately sell these teams. I don't think the second generation, the next generations, will be able to afford to run them the same way they they, you know, they were years ago. And the new set of buyers are going to include these athletes. Because if you look at one of our clients, for example, Joe Burrow, Joe Burrow stays healthy. He's going to earn a half a billion dollars in the field if he does what we help him do and others help him do wisely. He's got a great wealth manager. He will end up with a billion or more dollars. He starts, start, you know, suddenly can be a player and can turn that billion into whatever else. He can be a player in owning a team. So I think that's a, uh, a clear trend we're going to see. The Mets bid, which Stevie Cohen won, but we were actually participating in a different bid with 15 of our guys. So I, I think that's one thing for you to kind of keep, a, keep an eye out, just the, you know, where these players actually participate in, in, in 
team ownership down the road is going to be very different. We used to be, you know, these old kind of white families from, you know, steel towns and, and, and you know, industrial cities. Now it's going to be a very new generation of owners that's going to include players, which I think is something that should be interesting to you and, and hopefully. Yeah, for uh, sure. I mean, it's... Uh, it was such a moment, I felt, when, when LeBron said, like, there is not an NBA, I'm still a player, there is not an NBA team in Las Vegas, but I want to own an NBA team in Las Vegas. There and you like, go. That's who's going to stop that example. guy? Like, um, yeah, it just feels like me, the next Dwayne, 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 Dwayne did the Jazz deal with Ryan Smith, but Dwayne Wade's learning how to be an owner. He's not just throwing his money in to put his name on it. He's learning how to be an owner, and he's smart, and he's thoughtful. And if Dwayne Wade wants to be the principal owner of a team down the road, he'll do that. He may or may not want to do that, but if he does, he will be able to. Yeah. Yeah, well, very cool. Mark, thank you so much for joining us. Super interesting conversation. You know, I, I could go two, three hours on this, but I, I think our listeners would appreciate it. Nice back, I will say yes. Our product. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. Thanks so much for joining us. And uh, yeah, we'll be in touch. All right. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to this conversation. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you enjoyed all our episodes. I really appreciate you tuning in. Do subscribe to The Lead Off. It's, gonna, it's a great product already, and we've got some exciting stuff coming in the new year. So we'll see you there. Thank you.